Hello, welcome to this F-Secure webinar on General Data Protection Regulation or among friends GDPR. Uh, with me here in the studio to discuss about this uh, regulation is Principal Security Consultant Antti Vahasipila. Nice to be here. And our Risk Management Consultant Laura Noukka. Nice to be here also. Well, they both are from F-Secure's Cybersecurity Consultancy arm. My name is Erka Koivunen and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer of F-Secure. So everybody has heard quite a lot about GDPR. It has been a long time in the making. Uh, there's one year to complete the compliancy programs within the companies. And then I guess we all just have to learn to live with the new regulation. And uh, in this discussion with our distinguished consultants, we would love to see beyond the horizon of 25 May 2018 and uh, figure out what is it that the companies need to, what, the, what type of new reality the companies would need to live with once the regulation is in effect. So to begin with this, Laura, would you love to present us what is it that actually is going to happen after May 2018? What type of new world would we have with us? Well, companies have two possibilities. They can see privacy as a uh, compliance issue, or then they have opportunity to make it a business driver. And to be able to make it a business driver in the future, you have to already today make the decision that is your business or do you want your business to be a bus uh, information driven and is the personal information going to be a vital asset for your business? But I think, sorry, uh, but I think what you said is that uh, uh, it's okay to be compliance only as well, right? Yeah, if it's based on your business needs. Right. So, yeah, I would like want to draw a comparison to PCI, which is the payment card industry data security standard, which uh, um, is about uh, processing credit card numbers. So if you look at any online shop there, most of them just like don't really want your credit card number. They uh, uh, just uh, drive you to some other site who actually then process it. So in a similar way, I, I think that it's like viable for many companies to address personal data in the same way, right? Yeah, I agree with you. Especially if you are in poor B2B business and you don't process a lot of personal information, mm -hmm. then it's only a compliance matter for you. Right. But if you are straight on B2C business and you have a lot of information and there are ways that you could uh, develop your business based on the information, then it's a strategic opportunity for your business and you need to start preparing your operations based on that. So would it be fair to say that you, at this point, you can decide how much GDPR will influence you by determining what reliance on personal data processing your company has. Like with PCI, if you would be in a position to outsource payment processing, the PCI would not be a big issue to your company. You would outsource the burden of being compliant or burden of being excelling in that to somebody else. Yeah, I think we might see that in the future that companies who only think it's a compliance matter will outsource the processing. Well, of course, you, you can outsource the processing, but will, you will still be the controller. So essentially, uh, you will probably have the liability still. But it is possible that some company that actually uh, excels in processing will be able to do a very good job in that processing. So the risk of liability will be low, right? Yeah. At this point, it is good to remind that you can ask questions, post comments on the chat functionality in the, in the, uh, during this webinar. We have people 
uh, replying to you and after this session we three are going to be joining you to answer the remaining questions. So we now identified that there are strategic approaches to how compliant or how dependent you want to be on the GDPR requirements. Uh, uh, should we have a deeper dive into these different, different types of options? Let's start with the, the fact that you just want to be compliant. You just want to do the right. absolute minimum. What options do you have? Well, I, this is, of course, hard to foresee, uh, but if I'm looking to my crystal ball, I think that we'll, we'll see the uh, profil profileration of companies such like uh, Salesforce, who are currently um, processing a lot of uh, personal data uh, for managing your sales process, basically. So, uh, in a way, uh, for example, uh, companies that have customer data they probably would uh, start using uh, software as a service type uh, services more for the information processing. So then, there's like a proliferation of services that brand themselves to be the processor of somebody else's personal yes, data. and it might be also sectoral, so different sectors and different verticals might have their own. But this is just a guess, so we will see where that where that's going. But for a company that is currently not looking into CRM sol solutions like Salesforce, this would be a great moment to start actually charting the options. Yes, and of course, if you are a startup founder in search of an idea, maybe this is something to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything to add, Laura? Uh, no, I think uh, Ante said it all on those companies, but then we have also two different types of companies. We have those who had the in, uh, personal information and want to analyze it, but it's quite basic analytics that they are doing. And then we have those who really think their business is uh, data driven mm. and they need to build the knowledge and processes to process and analyze that information according to GDPR. Right, so I, I think what you're saying is that the more bespoke analysis you want to do, the, the more likely it is that you have to bring in the data close to you or in-house and then GDPR will hit you uh, in a bit more or deeper way, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do you think that it will be uh, difficult to change your opinion if you now take a strategic uh, direction to be one of, one of the, these company types? Will it be difficult to change your mind afterwards? If you now decide to only be compliant, then it will be hard in the future to change in a data-driven uh, company and that's why that now... You would be more reliant on the outsourced service yeah. provider. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, if you aspire to be just compliant, you will not reap the benefits of deep analysis of your customer data or behavioral data of your uh, services uh, and etc. Yes. So now it's really important time to make this decision and you can't do the decision whether to be only compliant or not based on your current situation. You also have to foresee your business in the future. What does your competitors do? Uh, what would you like to do in a few years time? Let's say three to five years uh, time span, what are your objectives then? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's focus for the companies that have decided to not merely be compliant but instead want to be more involved, take, take more responsibility of the data processing, uh, perhaps in an effort to get some added business benefit for that. 
should we start by describing what type of personal data actually we're talking about? Where does it manifest? How do, how do we get it? Where do we store it? Would you love to yeah. run us through? We are not talking about the HR uh, processes and the company's own personal information, of course, here. Yeah, that would be the, the first instinct. Uh, then, yeah, the and there yeah. you have to be compliant. But uh, the information that you can benefit is the information related to your business processes. How effective is it that you're in sales? How good, how many leads do you have? What's the conversion yeah, rate? Yeah, of course, I mean, when you have customers, you want to profile the customers, you want to extract uh, like uh, higher levels of understanding and information about your customer data and their yeah. be behavior. And this is, uh, of course, something that CDPR is very interested in uh, uh, sure. uh, on the, on the yeah, level that, of the legal text. I guess it's fair to say that the GDPR is not forcing you to stop processing of personal data. No, it just I, yes. puts limits and formats how to do that. Yes. So let's, let's assume that you are not able to, and you are not willing to just outsource the, the processing to uh, service uh, uh, provider, w w do you do you need to then have it on prem like in the 90s? Have your own server with the catalog of all your customers, some paper stack somewhere? Yeah, well, luckily not. I mean, we we, we already now have uh, a number of infrastructure providers that can uh, provide, for example, big data analytics uh, services and. Uh, I mean, the underlying infrastructure of those services in the cloud. So, so you built your systems on top you, you of could, that You, you could build platform. your systems on top of that. But then yeah. if, you, if you are doing a lot of bespoke development, me, meaning that uh, you are not uh, buying an uh, off-the-shelf software as a service uh, analysis system, then you have to realize uh, the uh, design and architectural uh, effect that CDPR will have and you have to plan appropriately. So that would actually require that you take a more involved role in architectural design of your systems. Mm, yes, that, and that's, that, that is a very good point because if you look at the, well, currently when companies are driving towards the uh, GDPR compliance, many of those uh, programs are uh, led by either the legal team or the IT and uh, information security team, right? Or yeah. what do you think? Yeah. Um, there are companies who are also involving the enterprise architecture folks in there. And I think that's a, that's a great thing to do. Yeah, because otherwise if it's led by the legal, then you often concentrate on agreements. And those agreements no matter how well they are written, they don't give you any business opportunity. It's just that if something happens, it's good to have the agreements in place, but to take the advantage of the processing of the data, they have no role. Yeah, so the, the legal team, definitely they are there to stop you from making big and costly mistakes. Um, a lawyer friend of mine reminded me that most companies, when they start addressing data privacy, if they are not mature enough, they start navel gazing in HR processes like the, the employer, uh, employee data, because these are the teams that are typically in close proximity in your offices with your legal team. So you would advocate that you reach out to a second floor, another floor in your office. Which type of roles should you involve in, in this? Well, yeah, legal, of course, needs to be involved. Yes. There's no question about so that. So no hiding behind the legal. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, but, but like I said earlier, uh, if you have an enterprise, uh, architecture function. So people who think about how your uh, the all of our all of your systems uh, come together to process the uh, data that you need for the for your business processes. Then I think that that uh, team probably 
should not only be involved, but maybe even should lead your post uh, May 2018 GDPR activities because if you uh, only look at information security, for example, or if you just look at legal, uh, those uh, functions typically cannot affect how your personal data is being functionally processed by the systems, whereas enterprise and system architects uh, are actually on the driver's seat yeah. there. So whatever requirements you have, you wouldn't have systems to support that? Yes, well, you design. yes. So if you take just a very simple example, if you need uh, to do um, erasure of one individual's data from the systems, if your systems... Which sounds easy and try to do that. Yeah, so <laughs> it, I mean, especially if your systems don't have any sort of handle on one individual, um, then um, are you going to do that manually? That in the long run, that might cost you quite a bit. Yeah. So, and this is, this is really an enterprise level issue. And if you have a large number of disparate systems, you'd probably want to have some sort of harmonized way of addressing the subject access and um, like individual rights issues as well. You are our cybersecurity consultants, and uh, you, at some point of time in your assignments, you always take the topic of risks, cybersecurity risks, and I would imagine that a GDPR-related consultancy gig would not be complete without talking about what could go wrong, how to prepare for that. Laura, would you like to run us through what is it that you bring up with your customers? Well, basically, the risks, uh, there are two types. There is the data breach, mm. and then there are the individual's rights. So you consider the, the rights to be a risk? <laughs> yeah, it's risk for your operational processes. Uh, for as that. Antti, mm. we're talking about uh, enterprise architecture. Uh, and so it's a uh, to erase the information from your yeah. systems. And if you don't have the processes in place, it's a risk that can you do it. It's a risk that you can uh, control, at least control more than the breeds, because yes. you can communicate with the individual. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a, uh, a data breach, then you are definitely not in a driver's seat anymore. Uh, probably not even on the same vehicle anymore. Yeah, you're I running mean, running behind the car and the wait. wait exactly, wait. exactly. Yeah. If you if you are caught of being non-compliant or being uh, slow to respond to individual yeah. uh, requests, then of course that's something you. It's a situation where you don't you don't want to be in. But it's uh, not like a big bang breach. It's something that you can manage over some time. So I guess that the risk actually comes from uh, the additional cost that you then have to pour into that. And if you have a large volume of these uh, risks realizing, then, then that might cost you a bit more. Should we yeah. try to, to, to put it in concrete terms? What types of situations would you encounter when the data subjects' rights would need to be manifested? We already touched on the one topic where customer wants their data to be deleted. And that is a fair request and surprisingly difficult to make real, uh, real if your systems don't uh, support that type of functionality. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What types of situations would you have when the data subject well, would have a legitimate request that would be surprisingly difficult to for a company to well, comply purely, with? From purely technical perspective, um, Eraser, like you said, is one. Then uh, stopping the processing um, either for a while um, or completely mm -hmm. uh, for one named subject is probably uh, slightly difficult with many systems. Then there's, of course, the uh, period of how long you have to hold on to the data. And you have to define that, and then you have to enforce that. And uh, if you think about a... Uh, so it cannot just be dead letter on the terms of services. Right. And uh, 
think about your uh, big data storage, for example, if you if you start to accrue terabytes and terabytes of data, how are you going to um, address the the retention period of that data? Yeah. So that's th these are uh, some of these issues. Yeah, and if you have been uh, giving the data mm. to your partners, you are still responsible to inform also them that you, the information needs mm. to be erased. Yes. Yes. So, so you, you need to know your processes really well to be able to do this. Would it, would it be correct to characterize that you would want to define your processes in a fashion that at some point of time you can safely tell that this remainder of the data is anonymized. So in the likely event of a data subject requesting a removal or extraction of that data, you can say that after that point, we don't even know whose data is it. Yes, we can well, still mm -hmm. continue processing it. Yes, especially uh, in a case when you are like piling the data into some sort of uh, uh, data storage that you know that it will be hard to do any of these erasure or uh, stopping the processing, uh, then it is very good idea to scrub the data so that it's anonymized before you put it in there, yes. And this is exactly something that you need to discuss with your enterprise architects, so like I said earlier, because if you require the person to be identified because of your business needs, then obviously that's at odds with the requirement to anonymize the thing. Yeah, you cannot have... Yes, you cannot the, have your cake, cake and eat it too, yeah. yes. So, yes. Uh, would, you, would, you, would it be correct to characterize that the, the decisions on data privacy that you make may actually contribute to your security posture? your ability to withstand stress, attacks. Yeah, I think that this kind of goes back to what Laura said earlier about different types of risks. So the data breach risk is something that is very clearly on the InfoSec area. And uh, now if you think about how the uh, company should react uh, to both of these risks, maybe they I have a feeling that maybe they would like to run them as like two different threads, so to speak, like asynchronously of each other. Yeah. Um, so the data breach risk could be mitigated by kind of old-fashioned information security, of course, building proactively. Uh, so that would be in the incident response process? Yes, not only that, but also proactive activities, like right. building your new systems so that they, well, all the new systems become legacy at some point. Mm -hmm. And now everybody's cursing the 25-year-old legacy pile that you have. Yeah. And uh, you, you can actually try to design your uh, upcoming system so that when they will be legacy, uh, you won't be cursing them that much. And you can, you can tr aim, aim at that target. Uh, so, so when you bought them, you were buying them in a hope that data would be the oil. Well, you, and you probably when you, didn't even think about that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. after 25 years, they become asbestos or uh, <laughs> yeah, something yeah, that's you a, that's want a, to hide and yes. not say to the potential buyer that. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that, that's the, the other thing. We can get to the uh, kind of reactive stuff in a moment. Um, on the area of um, being able to respond, for example, to the uh, subject uh, requests or the uh, requests from the individuals, then it's even more of a proactive system design problem. And But that might not have anything to do with information security at itself. So the data breach risk is mitigated by mostly by information security centric activities, proactive or reactive. Yeah. And the other risk would probably be mitigated by proper architectural design. Yeah. Uh, and that's more like functionality and not a quality of the system. Yeah, which this brings it actually pretty close to my own mm. job description. If you ask me about compliance issues in terms of GDPR, I typically take the breach point of view. And if you want to have a fuller picture, you might want to invite 
marketing, sales, system architectures, and people who actually have a broader view of why is it that we actually have the data in-house. Mm -hmm. I, I believe our company is not collecting customer data just for the joy of being prepared for the breach. We probably have a business to run. Yes, right. Yeah. Going to the data breach detection and response plans, um, uh, what advice do you have the, for, the, for customers in terms of how to prepare for the worst? Well, prepare your crisis management processes from the detection uh, to early actions and to the crisis management inside your company and also the crisis management outside. So the communication, communication, it's the key in your, outside your company. Sure. And yeah. the, the regulation is, one big aspect of this regulation is that when you have a breach, it's not anymore something that you can handle it within your organization. You cannot, it, you cannot hide it. If you attempt to hide it, it will make only things worse. Yes, yes I, I think that, uh, I mean, um, the data protection authorities are allowed to communicate about your uh, breach sure. without actually uh, involving you if, if everything goes yeah. really down the drain. Yeah, so, so you would not be holding no. a wheel, yes. you would yeah. be... Right. Yeah, so running behind. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned um, like practicing for the hopefully evitable, but uh, maybe the uh, practicing for the uh, situation yes. when the uh, things actually hit the fan. Uh, yeah. But if if they do hit the fan, what's next? What do we have to do? Well, well, the first thing is. To, to start the stopwatch and set it to 72 hours? To 70, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right, what you okay. do. Then yeah. you have the 72 hours and those are the most critical yeah. hours mm. you have in that crisis. Yeah. Mm. So your process should be launched effectively. Right, okay. And so no fast. There's no time to waste now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And many companies have their crisis management teams and they have processes. But uh, cyber and breaches haven't been the topics for CMTs. For, right, uh, okay. Before. And with CMT, let's explain uh, yeah, that to the audience. Crisis management team, which is uh, composed of normally from the CEO and the business unit leaders from the company to start mitigating the crises. And those crises would manifest in several types of uh, forms, yes. not only IT security. Yeah. yeah, and historically it's not been the IT related uh, incidents that have been yeah. on CMT's agenda. Mm -hmm. And that would be one thing for all CISOs to take with, to make the privacy uh, training topic for their CMTs during next year. Because there is a lot of internal communication is the, in this kind of uh, breach uh, incidents mm. that you don't normally have. There is IT, there is business, and then there is this crisis management team led by CEO. The CEO and the IT don't normally talk same language, so it's really important to train for that internal communication to be able to provide good external communication in this kind of a crisis situations. And I guess one thing to note is that when you are communicating those breaches, you are expected to provide helpful advice for the customer, what they can do on their terms to mitigate the threat. Yes, so in, in that sense, you as a company who has experienced the breach, 
you are not anymore in the center. It's the data subject that you have to serve with this communication. So it will be really useful, for example, to know which of your customers have actually been impacted. Sure. So How valuable the data yeah, is for so, them. So if you think about, um, if you, if you think about the uh, incident response or incident management capabilities on the IT side, if you now think about the data breach, for example, mm. uh, it would be a really good idea probably when you start um, an incident response uh, capability building in your company that you take a moment to really to verify that in an event of a breach, what sort of auditable information do I have on my systems? So it's a great place to go through your uh, audit logging um, practices, for example, and uh, everything that can actually give you tangible information that you can provide both to the impacted customers and the data protection authorities. And yeah, we, we mentioned the 72 hour time limit. It might be even debatable when the 72 hour started based on the evidence that you are able to produce. Yeah, exactly. So it makes sense to even start making notes when you learn of the breach and note the time. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> the downside is that if you have really good detective capabilities, you will learn about this earlier. But maybe I, I have a feeling that that's not the place to optimize if you, if you, if you want to optimize for the 72 hours. In terms of exercising, in what flavors do these exercises come from? What would you recommend? Well, you can do a tabletop exercise where you collect uh, people that uh, are important for crisis management, so the crisis management team uh, around the table and you give them a scenario of an uh, incident. No, yeah, no. yeah. You don't need to breach your company. No, you don't need to yeah. breach, yeah. but you but can, you, but yeah. you can uh, add a flavor with red teaming simultaneously. So combining a tabletop exercise with red teaming that there is really something happening same time in your organization. This would be a good time to actually explain what red teaming is. What does it mean? Yes, well, red teaming is essentially uh, a group of highly skilled, usually technical people, social engineers, and, uh, well, they come in various shapes and forms, who try to uh, get uh, into your company and you can define what sort of uh, activities they're allowed to do. So either a physical break-in, is that in the books or not? and then, of course, um, penetrating into your company network, for example, so. And that would be mm -hmm. a good one to add to a tabletop exercise. Mm -hmm. Then you would have a real... So in the tabletop exercise, you would have a scenario of things that are falling apart. You would have main stakeholders reviewing those scenarios and responding according to how they see would be fit to address the problem. With red teaming, you expect them to come up with surprises, yes. surprising elements of yeah. you, things that you wouldn't know taking red, place in your networks. Red teaming is a kind of a sit test for, uh, for your current status. So red teaming should be always understood as a demonstration in a way that uh, when you fix all the things that the red teaming actually found, it doesn't mean that you still are secure. You really, red teaming uh, can be used to show the, what your current state of security is. So in that case, for example, if you are an um, information security officer, uh, but you are not getting the pull from, from the above for implementing all these security things, for, for example, for the GDPR, uh, red teaming can help you to find the smoking gun that you need in order to take this, to, to feel the urgency of this issue in your organization. Owning your own company. In Owning your own company, yes. Yeah. Uh, would it be fair to uh, state that in a tabletop exercise scenario, you typically kind of, a, in, the, in the scenarios, you write down that this and this has been kind of detected yeah. And with red teaming, you test whether you actually detect yes, a breach. Yes, that, that, that is possible, yes. So, 
uh, and you you mentioned about optimizing for the detection in a fashion that. Yeah. So <laughs> what I meant before was that you don't want to optimize your. 72-hour uh, reporting period by not detecting. Yeah. So you want to detect early if you can, because yeah. that is looked at favorably by all the parties. And also, of course, if you can catch somebody in the act early enough, maybe they will be less likely to, to be able to pull off even a bigger haste. And, I, and of course, if you uh, detect the breach yourself, it gives you better, it's easier for you to respond and handle the image risks that Probably. is always yeah. And in the there. US where these uh, data breach notification requirements have been mm. in place in 40 sta 46 states mm. already, there is plenty of evidence of the public uh, discourse after these breaches being more favorable to those companies who have been in a position to detect the yes. breach yeah. themselves. If you can show that you can manage this kind of uh, situation, yeah. it can even have a positive impact yeah. on your company's image. What, mm. what can you do to actually build up that type of a detection capability? Well, uh, you can do uh, proactive uh, system design, of course. You can have proper audit logging in place, and then you have uh, products such as and services such as FCQRs, Rapid Detection Service, or RDS. Um, the mix that you choose is, it, it depends on your own situation and risk perception and what sort of things you have in place. So for example, if you have a, like a pile of this 25-year-old um, technology lying around, you might not be able to do a lot of proactive work on that one but you can still add on a uh, detection service. Yeah, and I guess um, in reality, mm. most of the data breaches and most of the data leaks have been brought to the attention of the company by third parties. And you definitely would want to have your in-house capability of detecting mm. when the data is being exfiltrated or when somebody is even coming in with the intention of exfiltrating that data. So uh, you mentioned that you could use red teaming to kind of um, get the attention of top leadership in terms of bringing some concrete evidence of where things are failing. Would you advise, how, how would you advise CISOs to spend their limited budget since red teaming costs money, and then you address the problems identified by red teaming with which money? <laughs> well, I hope, I hope that the spent decisions are made on, uh, based on uh, some risk perception, hopefully quantified risk analysis, wouldn't you think? So that you yeah. can actually put a price yes. on the different types of GDPR risk and also the mitigations and all the exercises you're going to run. Yeah, a really important point for CISO is to be able to quantify the IT and uh, privacy risks. So how much would it really cost for the company? Mm. So that would not be just a list of network nodes being compromised, list of user accounts being compromised and trying to get your CEO to understand that this is important. To describe to your top leadership about the price, mm. the risk elements of these breaches, and with proper design, you could yeah. even identify which portions of your uh, uh, systems are such that they don't pose great risk even when breached. Mm. Yeah. So they are disposable in the fashion. Yeah. Would, it, would it be correct to? Yeah. This is an ideal world. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and when you are quantifying the risk... Uh, You're not talking about high, medium, low traffic Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Exactly. It's not the red risk. But you can quantifi quantify a breach uh, by considering the effect it will have on your company. How much work will like, the 
will it de require from your IT, from your uh, commercial, from your legal? And do you, for example, have to drive a campaign to make your image mm -hmm. uh, clear your image afterwards? Yeah. So mm -hmm. those are the things that you can, uh, so you can calculate link. the costs. Yeah, you can create a link between a set of compromised computers and your brand value. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It has been a pleasure discussing with you about the GDPR. Thank you. Would you have any closing remarks of what is it that now that we have one year to complete our projects to be compliant and after that we would need to start living with the new reality. What advice, closing, closing advice would you have for our audience? Until you go well, first. Yeah, okay. From my part, I would just uh, maybe say that uh, um, if you think about the future after the GDPR takes force, um, if you, for example, haven't uh, involved uh, your architects and system designers yet in, in the post-GDPR thinking, then I would actually do it right now. So that uh, would be an acronym it, that your system architects haven't heard of yet. Yes, this or would be a great they probably time. have heard of it. Maybe they haven't been involved in your yeah. uh, project, but that would yeah. definitely be something that I would start right now. It yeah. doesn't have to change the uh, track of your current CDPR compliance project, but uh, I mean, we still have a year to go, and if you can get those folks up to speed during this year, then they will be able to. Uh, catch the ball when yeah. uh, from May onwards. Laura? Yeah, well, if you are still in the situation where you are making the decision that are we data driven or mm. not, look beyond the 2018. Look 2020 or something. Yeah. Like Try to find out where you want to be in 2020 or after five years from now. Yeah. and make the decision based on that situation. Because if you now make the wrong decision and you want to change the way your business yeah. is operated, yeah, then it will be really expensive. hard. Yeah. Mm. And then, of course, GDPR is not the only piece of legislation involving uh, handling these topics. There's uh, something brewing up from Brussels in called e-privacy regulation that addresses some of the privacy concerns from the communication service provider yes. right. side of things. Yes. And this is something that I believe we could continue this discussion in the future about when we learn more about this e-privacy sure regulation. Sure thing, yes. All right. That has been a great pleasure. Enjoy it. And Let's continue with the chat for a moment. Thank you.